everyone, and welcome back to this lecture here in Cultural Anthropology. We are actually at the halfway point here in week five, so we'll go over the week five lecture. And keep in mind that this week we're looking at three chapters, and it's a little more reading than normal, but I think you'll see that these three chapters connect pretty nicely so that you're going to see a lot of continuity between the three topics. In one sense, you could say they all go hand in hand in terms of talking about these themes. Specifically, this week we're looking at subsistence, economics, and politics. And each of these goes along with the chapter, so chapters 5, 6, and 7. And one thing I want to say is, um, since we're at the midpoint of the class, is I've always said this in cultural anthropology, you could always think about, for every chapter that you encounter in this class and set of themes, to really consider three or four key ideas per chapter that you can take with you. And by take with you, I mean outside the exams in this class, the quizzes, the papers, the discussions, and the fact that it fulfills a particular general education requirement, how can you actually use these ideas in your own life, whatever that might be? As an example, when we talk about subsistence, we're living in a time right now, not just of COVID-19, but a lot of concerns about our lifestyle, about the effect of our lifestyle on the planet. So can you take one idea from, say, the subsistence chapter, chapter five, and apply that critically to your own perspectives, to how you're leading your life, to things you could change. And it's something for me and all of us to do. It's not just to say students should do this. All of us should certainly take these ideas from anthropology and try to apply them to our own lives, our own perspectives and context. So I wanted to mention that just as a general goal here as we're at the midpoint in the class, week five. Now, we'll go over the chapter learning objectives. As always, you can look these over and these will highlight the key issues in the chapter and some of the takeaways that you might think about. So definitely look over those on the module. So this week we're talking about subsistence and as the book talks about at the beginning of chapter 5, subsistence is a really key concern of anthropology. I can't think of an anthro class that didn't cover subsistence at some level, including my archaeology classes and biophysical classes where we're often talking about what we can infer about subsistence based on the archaeological record, or in the case of biophysical anthro, maybe what diet did to the human body and how we can infer that or determine that scientifically by looking at remains of the body or live bodies and doing various studies of those bodies um, to understand more about subsistence. So they talk here at the beginning about thinking about your own meal and then thinking about subsistence. So subsistence refers to anything that we do in a society to acquire food, whatever that happens to be. A lot of people, as the author mentions, cannot really recall where the food comes from. And in fact, sometimes you try to search for where something is made. And this is not just in the case of food, but in any kind of consumer good. And sometimes you can't exactly locate where the thing was made. Or you find ironic situations like you might buy a frozen pizza and discover it was um, shipped in from Italy. And you kind of think about, well, in this age of talking about carbon footprint, um, or even people are using the term carbon shadow, what um, can we say about something like that, a situation where we're living in a more global um, circumstance where food is coming in from all over the world? So globalization, I think, is something we might consider at the end of the chapter. So subsistence refers to making a living. All the things that we do in life typically typically refers to food, and obviously we need food for, for living. We also talk about food ways in this chapter, and those refer to norms and cultural values about food and eating. So obviously our society, and by our society I'm assuming that all of us live in a consumer society. I shouldn't make that assumption. Many of you may not. In fact, some of you could live in a kibbutz or live in a communal situation where maybe your food ways are much different. And as much as that is true, please share that with the class because I'm always having to stop myself from the assumption saying, well, because I live in a consumer society, the rest of you do as well. You might, but it's not always the case. So that's important to think about as we talk about our various food ways, the meanings and attitudes and norms that we have about the things we eat. Again, I have my own perceptions about the food ways in a consumer society, and very often um, they're upsetting to me. I, I feel very often like, you know, maybe we're not eating the healthiest diet or we're not having the most positive impact on the environment due to our diet and our subsistence practices. 
this is definitely one of those weeks where we can look very cr critically inward at ourselves, be reflexive, and really ask some important questions. So in studying subsistence systems, we can talk about the concept of carrying capacity. If you get a chance, you might come across the work of Thomas Malthus, and very important, I remember reading him in so many of my different classes, geography classes, anthropology classes, of course, and he was often interested in this idea that there's a certain amount of carrying capacity available to a given environment. At some point, when population grows too much and resources dwindle relative to that population size, you can definitely have a situation where carrying capacity is exceeded in that particular ecosystem or place. And, and they mention here that Malthus sort of had a grim uh, notion of humanity's future, but it gives us opportunity again to think as we move towards the end of the quarter and talking about the Anthropocene and the human impact on the environment, that negative human impact, how we can make a difference and maybe make a change. They also talk here about an interdisciplinary perspective. I think that's really important. So if you're taking other classes in ecology, in biology, in geography, geology, it would be really important to bring in some of those perspectives. And as much as those relate, you can always talk about those other perspectives in your discussion posts this week. We can now talk about modes of subsistence. And modes of subsistence refer to the way is in which we go about creating subsistence opportunities for ourselves. We can talk about the principle of the domestic economy. You'll often hear the idea of modes of production. This actually derives from the work heavily of Karl Marx, and Karl Marx gets uh, his notion of the mode of production from Scottish Enlightenment philosophers. And in particular, Marx talks about an approach or four types of modes of production that we're also going to address here in a little bit in the chapter. So it's kind of interesting that if you're taking sociology, some of this may parallel with Marx, Marxist discussions of mode of production, um, superstructure, other issues like that. So if you're taking soci, it's a nice connection to make there. Now, the book mentions here that different societies or cultures have different approaches to subsistence. You can have an immediate return system or a delayed return. These are very easy to remember. So if you have an immediate return system, it's like you go out, you gather berries, you hunt, and you provide for your caloric needs right at that point. If you have a delayed return system, it means that you do maybe fishing or pastoralism or farming. And the idea is that you put in a lot of labor and you eventually kind of build up resources and eventually have things to eat that provide for your caloric needs for your body. Okay, so next, we have those modes of subsistence that I mentioned that Karl Marx addresses when he talks about modes of production. And actually, the only difference really is he talks about foraging, pastoralism, horticulture. Uh, in, in place of agriculture, he talks about modern capitalist society. And that's actually appropriate for us because the chapter ends on the point talking about Starbucks and other issues of uh, fair trade and free trade and so forth. So it would be important, I think, for us to consider these four, whether we're studying sociology or anthropology. So the mode of subsistence, how do we uh, procure food? How do we gather food to provide for our caloric needs? Four basic types, these are really good to know. And then what you can do is start to kind of chart in your mind how one provides for people and then how that connects to other issues. You could actually make a handy chart for this. And the book talks about, for example, gender relations. What happens in pastoralist society, say among the Maasai, where maybe women don't have as much connection to cattle, therefore they lack power in that society. So it's a great opportunity to connect these four types of subsistence or modes of subsistence to other issues out there, not just the types of subsistence systems they have, knowing that foragers or hunter-gatherers gather wild plants and animals, whereas pastoralists rely on the domestication of livestock, animal husbandry, and that type of stuff. But to really connect these issues to more social and cultural topics. And again, it's an opportunity for us to think about how maybe in our type of society, in a capitalist society heavily relying on agriculture, but a lot of other technologies in terms of our food ways and food systems, we often have a form of alienation where we're disconnected. As the author talks about at the beginning of the chapter, we often don't know where our food comes from, and therefore that suggests some kind of alienation or disconnection between, between ourselves and what we're actually eating, which could be a, a key problem. So we talked about foraging or hunter-gatherer approaches. Pastoralism, again, is the livestock approach. Horticulture, 
is small-scale cultivation of crops used for subsistence, whereas agriculture is the big stuff. It's the big, industri now we call it industrialized agriculture. And I would say that that movement, at least in the U.S. and maybe parts of Europe, to more large-scale industrialized agriculture has led to concerns about our food systems, has led to movements like free range, which I know is still controversial, and has even led to people taking on vegetarian, vegan, or other lifestyles, um, even talking about freeganism, which, which is one of our topics for this week. So I'm not going to go through each of the systems of subsistence. You should definitely look these over. I really like this chapter because I think the examples given from cultures around the world are really significant. They give you a really nice picture of what each of the four types of subsistence looks like. So in the case of foraging, one key point is it's a broad spectrum diet. It's a diet based on a variety of resources. Later, when we talk about certain types of agriculture or horticulture, if it's what we call a monocrop system where there's only one crop, you worry about nutritional deficiencies. We know in our society today, we try to eat a balanced diet and that changes over time. Back when I was a kid, ages ago, um, the food pyramid was a total joke. They would show you things like for breakfast, you would eat cereal and toast and bacon and eggs. And it was like really a ton of starch and carbs. Nowadays, we know that carbs are not great eat, eat, eaten in excess, as nothing is really eaten in excess, but those carbs, of course, turn to sugar, and that can present a, a real problem. If you read folks like Michael Pollan and others, they talk about you know challenges in our diets based on some of the issues that we are in now because of, of our lifestyle and our approach to, say, agriculture and consumer life. So there's a discussion here of the uh, San or the Kung in the Kalahari and a lot of good examples here to look at. There's also this reference to gender inequality, jobs and inequality in general or equality. So it's another thing that you can kind of check out as you're following along to see some of the advantages and disadvantages of each of these approaches because as always, we would want to look at the ethnographic evidence. Now, the example of some Pacific Northwest society suggests that when you have situations where you have a lot of food surplus and some people don't have to be directly involved in the food production, you have specialization, but that can also lead to inequalities. So you might have something like the potlatch, which is a form of extreme gift giving where uh, very wealthy people give away a lot of um, quantities. It could be of food, of ritualistic goods, of economic goods for the sake of kind of creating um, a sense of harmony among um, maybe unequal groups or individuals in that uh, particular culture or uh, small, a small tribe or foraging group. Now, you can also talk about sort of the advantages of the foraging a hunter-gatherer lifestyle. Very frame, famous work by the anthropologist Marshall Solins. I remember this in my very first anthro class, this idea that we would study hunter-gatherer societies, we'd watch films on them, we would read about them. Many times we focused on the Kung, and that was the particular group that Solon studied. And Solon's had this statement, which I thought was really revolutionary and still is to this day, that hunter-gatherers represented the original affluent society. And people in my classes, I remember, would say, well, they don't have a lot of money or material possessions. Like, no, affluence doesn't mean, you know, you're Donald Trump and you have a gold toilet in your, you know, multi-million dollar condo in New York City. It might mean that you don't have to work a lot and you have everything you need. You have safety, shelter, security, you have um, food available. So thus, that is kind of the definition of affluence. And so it's interesting to think about in terms of hunter-gatherers and foraging societies, because certainly we could look at that lifestyle and our population wouldn't support us moving back to that type of subsistence. But it's interesting to think about the advantages. And on a small scale system, you could. Um, some of you may have watched uh, the show Naked and Afraid. I actually had a student years ago who was on that show, took a couple classes with us in Anthro and Soch. And that particular show, I think, is trying to put people in situations in harsh environments where they have to hunt for themselves, gather water. Of course, it's done for TV. There's a lot of editing and, and you know, a little bit of, um, I guess you could call it entertainment thrown in there where they try to get people pitted against each other. But what's interesting about that show is it shows you in harsh regions around the world, if you're not prepared to deal with those harsh realities, you often can't survive. And survivalists, you know, are, are, are a different matter, but I think it'd be interesting to look at sort of the survivalist movement and to see 
the extent to which those folks are relying on some of the traditional indigenous approaches of foragers and hunter-gatherers in terms of how they thought about subsistence. I'm skipping over some of this here a little bit, but really uh, great studies of the new cock you, you could look at as well, and um, just in, encourage you to read these over. Next, we go into pastoralism, and I mentioned earlier the, the Maasai have been studied very heavily as a pastoralist society. And pastoralism means you could raise a variety of animals. And, you know, it doesn't have to be just animals for slaughter. They could be used for milk. They could be used for fur, for um, different things that you get from an animal. And then those could be productive, if you will, providing for trade opportunities, providing for things beyond food and so forth. I know probably if you're reading this or considering this, you know, there's an ethical kind of quandary or an issue to deal with if you if you are vegetarian or vegan, if you don't eat meat. So I think that'd be interesting to discuss as well. Now, one thing that people often say about pastoralist societies is, as Native American societies come to mind as well, there often is a respect for the environment and for the animals. And there might be an attitude given, for example, if an animal is killed, there's a prayer or some sort of spiritual acknowledgement of the service of that, that animal. I realize that still could be controversial if you're vegetarian or vegan. So again, I think it'd be interesting to talk about pastoralism at, as it relates to your own food politics. Now, the one thing I will say is, when we talk about pastoralism in the book, way different than industrialized agriculture. When If you've seen the really terrible videos of chickens and other animals in these teeny enclosures, um, you know, often blind and just in terrible conditions, it's led a lot of people to express outrage about the differences in how animals that are used for food and other quantities or opportunities, if you will, are treated much differently and more harshly than animals, say, in traditional pastoralist societies. So a good opportunity for comparison there. Again, among the Maasai, there's a discussion here about gender dynamics, so I'd really ask you also to consider if women are lacking, as they mention, in not being able to own cattle, how does that relate to their own power or lack of power? And then is it true, according to the book at least, and I'm not an expert on the Messiah, I've studied them in a few cases, but not extensively, so I don't know this. But the question is, do they have, as the author suggests, other opportunities for empowerment in their society? There's also discussion of a pastoralism, private property. You can look over again. I'm just giving you the key highlights here. Then we go on to uh, horticulturalists. So horticulture as they suggest, differs from other kinds of farming. First, horticulturalists move their field, their farm fields periodically to use locations with the best growing conditions. It's often called shifting cultivation. So if you think of nutrients available in soil and so forth and different ecosystems, you wanna take advantage of the best growing conditions. Second, horticultural societies use limited mechanical technologies to farm, relying on physical labor, labor from people and animals like oxen that are used, say, to pull a plow instead of mechanical farm equipment. And finally, horticulture differs from other kinds of farming in its scale and purpose. Most farmers in the U.S. sell their crops as a source of income, but in the horticultural societies, crops are consumed by those who grow them or shared with others in the um, you know near community rather than sold for profit. So again, when you think of horticulture, don't think of industrialized agriculture where we're talking about the scale of what's in the U.S. If you ever drive down to Southern California, certain areas where there's huge cattle production and you see like thousands, 10,000, tens of thousands of cattle, and you can smell all that uh, coming in your car when you're driving, um, you know, you really have a sense of the scale of American style industrial ag agriculture, nothing like what we talk about here with horticulture. There's a really good example here discuss um, related to the trobrianders and the uh, the yam crop and specifically how yams are not just significance as a crop uh, or don't just have significance as a crop but they actually have connection to spiritual associations there might be magic connected to them and in some cases people actually might have you know a close connection to a yam um, and even the idea that a yam might wander away from their fields at night unless magic is used to keep them in place Malinowski, as you know, studied the Trobrianders, and there's a very famous uh, documentary film called Trobrian Cricket, which deals with the use of magic as an adaptation to the introduction of the colonialist British game of cricket. So the Trobrianders certainly are known for their different types of, of magic, 
And uh, it's interesting to consider this because again, it suggests a much different connection between people and the crops that they produce. So it would be something for us to consider in our own lifestyle. There's a, a case study here on uh, beans as well and a little bit about archaeological discoveries. Finally, we, we end with agriculture and Jared Diamond here, the famous geographer, has a, a good quote. The adoption of agriculture was supposedly our most decisive step towards a better life was in many ways a catastrophe from which we have never recovered. And so interesting to think about this as we move from the Neolithic Revolution, which was the Stone Age in which we saw new stone, stone tools being developed that allowed for new approaches to harvesting plants, to cultivating, tilling the soil, to doing things like harvesting the grain and processing it in various ways. If you've ever, ever seen communities, videos of people harvesting wheat and so forth and processing it for baking. It's a very intense process by all means. And so a lot of these tools that we see in the archaeological record then allowed for the development of new approaches, including the approach of agriculture that is very important to us obviously today. As you can see here, there's an intensification of horticultural strategies, and this discusses a little bit some of those differences like with tools. As a subsistence system, agriculture is quite different from other ways of making a living. The invention of agriculture had far-ranging effects on the development of human communities. In analyzing agriculture and its impacts, anthropologists focus on four important characteristics shared by agricultural communities. And I'll just go over these quickly, but read them in more depth. The first is the reliance on stable crops. The second is a link between intensive farming and the increase in population density. I can't tell you how much I studied this very issue in my undergraduate and graduate coursework in archaeology in particular. There's a huge section we do in archaeology on the development of agriculture, starting with the Neolithic Revolution. They mentioned the work here of uh, Bosserup and also later Binford. A lot of other folks as, as well, uh, White, uh, Gordon Child, others, who talked about different theories on how agriculture developed, sort of like chicken egg questions. Did humans and animals get closer to each other because they were sharing the same water sources and develop kind of a relationship? Did population push us to um, drive more towards agriculture because of the need to feed more mouths or did it happen kind of the opposite way? So again, kind of chicken and egg questions here. A third characteristic of agriculture is, is a division of labor, which is really key, something we talk about today. And then lastly, um, kind of connected to division of labor is that tendency to create wealth differences. So that's something else we recognize with agriculture. So again, as you go through each of these subsistence strategies, think very critically about what they imply to us in terms of our evolution, where we're at now, and maybe where we're headed in terms of the negative impacts on the environment. This is that discussion I mentioned, the origins of agriculture. So this is a really good box uh, to look at. The late uh, archaeologist Lewis Binford, very important in conversations about agriculture. And then we end on the global agricultural system. It's very short, and I did supplement this because I feel like it's it's a little lacking in, in some respects, but um, they're trying to keep these chapters at a manageable length. So talking a little bit about a commodity chain where we talk about what are the links and say the commodity chain for coffee, very interesting to think about. And then this issue of fair trade here, if beans are harvested and people are paid $1.40 a pound, but then you go to Starbucks and they're 10 to $20 a pound, what does that say about who's making the money in the commodity chain that is coffee? So important to think about as we're sipping our latte from Pete's or Starbucks or wherever we enjoy our coffee or make it at home, there are certainly some consequences to think about. So that is chapter five. There's a lot of good stuff in there. Again, I really encourage you to check out the four subsistence strategies and try to connect to your own experiences with subsistence and maybe some of those critical questions that we need to ask. Okay, let's jump into chapter six here. So chapter six, as I've been talking about, really does connect back to chapter five, subsistence, and also will connect to chapter seven if you think of these as kind of a triad of interest or context this week that really do tie together. So we'll talk here in looking at economic anthropology about what economic anthropologists look at versus, say, economics. 
And if you take an econ class, this actually could be a great connection to some of the context and issues that you consider in your econ class. We'll talk about the modes of production. We'll discuss reciprocity, redistribution, market-based economies, which I think are really key for looking at our society, and then end on the idea of global inequalities and how some of the capitalist systems of production really have a, a detrimental impact both on people in terms of issues like alienation and social stratification, as well as an impact on the planet, predicting a little bit what we'll talk about towards the end of the quarter, talking about the Anthropocene and this idea of this era in which we live, in which there's a super negative impact of our lifestyles on the planet. So again, a real opportunity this week to think about change and holding ourselves accountable, each and every one of us in this class, in our society, in many societies around the world. So we'll start with chapter six here, and as the author addresses, economic anthropologists are interested in the various ways in which people produce, exchange, consume material objects, and the role of immaterial things in our lives like labor, services, and knowledge, and all, how all these relate to securing our livelihood. So we talked in the last chapter about subsistence. We'll continue a, a focus here and, and really discuss how Economic anthropology is an attempt to connect the discipline of economics, focusing on money, exchange systems, even information systems, connecting in that to culture and what anthropologists consider in the everyday life situations that we've been talking about since week one in this class. A brief discussion of homo economics here and what we mean by this concept. And this, I think, is pretty interesting. Rather than focusing on simple forms of exchange and, say, individual decision-making in terms of economics, anthropologists, including economic anthropologists, which is, which is its own subfield of anthropology, really, focus on issues of production, exchange, and consumption. I think consumption will be a really good focus for us this week because it's something we can all relate to. And it's also something that we can take a role in in terms of thinking about social change and holding ourselves and our systems, in this case of economic subsistence and power and politics, accountable. And we'll talk about what that means this week. So I mentioned in the last chapter that the concept of the mode of production or the way in which labor is used to transform energy using tools, skills, organization, and knowledge that could include things like factories and systems of distribution and consumption, that this is connected to the work of Karl Marx, very important. So if you take a sociology class, you talk about this in a little more depth in terms of the Marxist approach. And in particular, when we talk about a capitalist system, we talk about a set of features. And we can, like we did in the subsistence chapter, make some comparisons between systems. So in that chapter, we talked about comparing foraging or hunter-gatherer lifestyle with uh, lifestyles of pastoralism, horticulture, and agriculture or systemic industrialized agriculture. We can do the same thing in this chapter. So what happens in a capitalist economic system? Well, as the book indicates, there are specific things we know connected to capitalism, private property owned by a capitalist class, workers selling their labor, and included in that is this notion of surplus labor that Karl Marx talks about, the stored up energy that you bring to the table when you work for a corporation that they depend on. And this is one reason that, in my opinion, we have to think about the power of labor unions and providing benefits to workers. If someone loses their job working in an Amazon factory, or in, a, in, in any workplace around the world, we have to think about, does that person have health care? Does the employer provide that to that person? Because they depend on that labor, that surplus value of labor that every worker brings to the table when they come into work every day of the week. So workers, of course, are selling their labor to the capitalists, and then surpluses of wealth are produced, and either these are kept as profit by the corporations or reinvested in production. There's been a lot of discussion recently of sort of the capitalist class in terms of uh, people who are working for big corporations like Amazon or Tesla and how much money they have made and how much their income has gone up over time versus the income increases of the CEOs. And it's pretty shocking detail if you see this. And I encourage you to look some of this up because it's a real concern in a capitalist society, the fact that you have limitless wealth that be, can be accumulated by some. And of course, people say, well, it's a market system. It's a free market. We might talk about the idea of Horatio Alger in sociology, this idea that you can go from rags to riches. Well, in fact, as we begin to investigate economic systems, including our capitalist system, 
of production, we begin to realize that it's not a fair or level playing field. If you are born into wealth in this country, you can go to an Ivy League school or you can go to a, um, a preparatory school, which can set you up for advantages either in the workforce, getting a degree or other opportunities, even with little experience. The legacy system as it relates to wealth in this country is has a massive impact on the outcomes and possibilities of life outcomes and work possibilities of everyday workers from lower socioeconomic classes versus those born into wealth. We'll talk about this in the connection later with the new series in 2021 called Made on Netflix, which is a very harrowing series talking about the plight of uh, poor people, including domestic abuse and so forth. So we can talk a little bit about domestic production, and this is the means of production that characterizes foragers and subsistence farmers. You're beginning to see here parallels between all the chapters. So what you can do is start to connect these. We talked about foraging in the last chapter. We'll talk about it more in the politics chapter in terms of power relations and social and kinship dynamics. In this chapter, we can think of it in terms of economics. And the main issue of are people provided for in terms of their economic or subsistence needs versus are they not? And what are the outcomes of those people in different circumstances? And so we can often tie this to systems of production or modes of production that we're considering in this chapter. You see some examples here about collective ownership that happens in foraging societies. We'll talk a little more in the marriage and family chapter about kinship relations. You get a lot of that in, in this chapter and chapters to come. In tributary production systems, such as, say, in uh, medieval Japan, feudal Europe, imperial China, you have situations where rulers and subordinates or subjects are divided into two kind of main classes, and then those who are working have to produce a form of tribute for the leaders. And so different systems obviously approach economics and distribution of wealth in different ways. Then we get to capitalist production. When we talk about capitalist production, as you can see, the uh, capitalists who own the means of production have a lot of power. And often there's a concern if it's not, say, a cooperative system or cooperatively owned corporation, often all the money goes to the people at the top, to the board members, the folks who have you know stock investments in these companies and who sit on multiple boards often of these companies. There's a real control of wealth at the very top of society. Again, if you look at the statistics, it's a clear indication that most of the wealth is owned by a very few people, at least when we talk about the United States. So again, a lot to consider this week in terms of the legitimacy of our system of production in a capitalist society. And I think fair trade is a really interesting issue for us to consider, particularly in terms of coffee. This idea of giving more of the money to the folks actually roasting, producing, harvesting the beans versus Starbucks or Pete's or the corporation. So you see a lot of good discussion of this. I really encourage you to look at this in depth and then ask some critical questions about your own consumption practices. Do you feel that this kind of economic approach focusing on fair trade is a good opportunity in this more global economic system that we all exist in. Discussions of the informal economy, good case study here. It also makes me think of the drug trade and how often the drug trade is connected to um, systems of the informal or black market economy and what it says about trying to maybe transform our economic systems or even subvert them. So interesting to think about whether you're looking at these trader situations here. You can also look at my Zabaline case study I have in the additional um, media for this week. It would also be a good opportunity to look at those uh, that particular case study. We can also now then shift to modes of exchange, and these are systems that we um, use to integrate economic and social relations and also then distribute material goods. So things like trade and so forth. In the classic world of anthropology, we always talk about reciprocity. I remember learning the three types of reciprocity in almost every one of my cultural anthro classes. So really key, what reciprocity means is someone gives you something, you get something in return. It could be something better, it could be something worse, it could be something equal. And in a sense, those are the three types of reciprocity, and we can go through these quickly here. So one is generalized, and it is what it says. It means we give a gift and we don't give the exact value of it or express um, you know, a time or a condition of getting something in return. So this means, as an example, I take someone out for dinner and I don't say, now I took you out for dinner and I paid, so I expect you to take me out for dinner and pay within a month. 
Most people wouldn't do that. That'd be tacky to say that among friends or family. But generalized means maybe five, six months down the road, that same friend takes you out and you pay for it. There's a funny set of scenes in Larry David's Curb Your Enthusiasm about paying and kind of this fake out thing where I think Richard Lewis and Larry David are joking about paying and so forth. And in some senses, that's an example of reciprocity or expectations about reciprocity not being fulfilled because maybe um, it's not sincere that Richard Lewis really is going to pay and Larry David accuses him of, of that or something. If you've seen that little shtick in uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm, you know what I'm talking about. Now, balanced reciprocity is there's more of a direct exchange. So there's more specificity given about the conditions of the return gift, what will be ex exchange in return, equal value, and then the specific time period. The Kula ring, or what we call um, a circulating canubrium, which is the fancy way of, of calling it, is a system in which the trading of different goods um, necklaces and armbands. I'm trying to remember this. It's been years since I've studied it myself, but um, it's very much conditioned and defined. So again, if there's a lot of definition of it, if the conditions of the type of good exchanged in return and the time period are specified, that means it's balanced. It's kind of easy. It's like the scale. It's like weighing it and there's equality of it. Whereas generalized means you're not really specifying things. The last type and then you can look at this work of uh, reciprocity at Christmas time and gift giving and what people say about gift gifting giving. I think this would be interesting for our discussions and in particular maybe talk about as we approach here the uh, Christmas holiday. If you're taking this in fall, if you're taking this in, in another quarter, um, it, it maybe isn't as relevant. But in the fall, we're thinking about Christmas maybe. If you celebrate it, some people celebrate Kwanzaa or Hanukkah or other holidays. A lot of people, I think, consider what this says here, that the holiday tradition is too ritualistic and maybe we're using it to enforce social relationships, but there's also a feeling that you have to one up someone with a gift. It's always bad. Like if I think you, you this gets into negative reciprocity. If you give a gift at a holiday exchange party and you get something in return and it's kind of crappy, do you feel bad about that? Or is just the, the act of it and the social relationship enacted or maintained rather conditioned by the gift giving, maybe all that really counts. So this, this relates to the third type is negative reciprocity. So they mention here different scams on the internet where someone is asking for um, you know a, a gift or asking for help or something like this. I don't know if this actually is a good example of negative reciprocity. I mean, it's it's a scam. I would think of something more like, um, you know, the the example here of gambling. One participant attempts to, um, you know, gain something from the other. And in casinos, of course, there's often an advantage to the house, except in, in some games and some contexts of, of certain games. And because of that, you could say it's a form of negative reciprocity where you put a few coins in, maybe you win every now and then, but the house is always making the, the money. And the whole odds thing with sports book as well is also, I think, something to consider. I recently saw an interesting show. Um, is it called Bad Sport or something like that? It's either on Netflix or Hulu. But they were talking about this one scam where these basketball players we're engaging, you could say, in a form of reciprocity that was very negative to some of the parties where they were trying to fix games um, with um, setting points and meeting the spread on, on those games and people making millions. And just the extent to which they were doing this and, and the, the level of convolution and how challenging it was for them to figure out the points um, just shows you the extent to which some people will go to to make a buck. And, and it's kind of an unfortunate situation if, if you've seen that that show and the, those examples. We can also talk about redistribution. So redistribution is a little different than reciprocity. We talk about how accumulated goods or labor are then dispersed at a later time or date in the system. The Internal Revenue Service could be an example of this where you might take tax money and then put it into other systems. You accumulate that. The IRS is controversial for a lot of people. I think particular people maybe from libertarian backgrounds are always concerned about this idea of big entities controlling things, whether it's the UN or the IRS, and then making decisions. Um, it also connects to the concept in political science that you might have considered which refers to the social contract, of course, the idea that you give up some of your individual rights 
in lieu of the state having some power. And they also not only have power, say, to redistribute wealth, but they have power to help you out with medical, educational, or safety, public safety services like fire and police. Um, and uh, people have often said we live in, in the United States, at least, in sort of a socialized system in terms of a lot of those public services. The other example of redistribution that comes up, I would say, is the lottery. In many states, the lottery is money that's taken and reinvested into education and other uh, noble public causes like uh, dealing with drug addiction or domestic violence or whatever. We can, of course, talk about market systems. The market system is very familiar to us. In a market system, of course, we have exchange that happens. Um, these are social institutions with, price, with prices or exchange equivalencies. They don't necessarily have to be localized. In fact, in today's day and age, we often talk about a global market and what that means. Markets, I think, are also controversial because in some cases we think we have a, quote, free market. But again, given what happens, at least in the U.S., in terms of poverty versus, say, legacy folks who are born into wealthy, almost like castes or class systems like in India, what happens in those differential um, situations in terms of what you're born into and then how that impacts your ability to be successful in a market-based society. So important stuff for us to consider this week in terms of thinking about um, how maybe this system is just or unjust. So some good opportunities here. Luck over the main lobster market case. I think it's a very good one. In terms of money, there are quite a few anthropologists, including Bill Maher at UC Irvine, who study money from an anthrop anthropological perspective. So in terms of the TIV Nigerian case, you can look at exchange systems and how these work. The uh, Ithaca Hours local currency system is pretty interesting. Thinking about this idea of local bucks, if you will, or money that can be exchanged and traded. It brings up a lot of issues of the informal um, economic systems we might talk about. You can check out my supplemental reading on feral trade this week, which is another interesting example. It also brings up Bitcoin cryptocurrency and examples of how people are trying to move away from these large conglomerates of banks more into uh, chain block systems, um, information that's stored on a computer, and that becomes the banking information, which raises some serious and legitimate concerns about the impact on the environment because you're using computers to do all this banking, storing all that cryptocurrency and all the information that legitimates um, how much money you have invested in crypto coins or, bit or bitcoins. So a lot to think about there in terms of alternative economic systems and money systems. When we get into consumption and global capitalism, I think we'll have a great opportunity to think about some of these issues as they hit us at home. So again, really take the opportunity to think critically about our consumption practices. I'll show you some of the media and reading at the end here that kind of supplements what's in the book. Check out the work of Elizabeth Chen, the anthropologist who's talked about Barbie dolls and uh, connections to race. I actually had the opportunity years ago to present on some panels with Elizabeth at the AAA meetings when we were doing some teaching workshops for up-and-coming anthropologists. So some great work to look at. And then as we talk about globalization, which we'll explore more later in that chapter, so we'll save some of this, we have a real concern about global inequality. Again, take the pattern that happens in the U.S. in terms of the wealthy and the poor, expand that worldwide, and it's even more dramatic and harsh. There was just in 2021 this new video that came out that was an expose of all these wealthy folks, including singers and celebrities, actors, politicians like Putin and even Tony Blair, you know, kind of more moderate or even left um, leaning politicians who had all these secret investments in offshore companies and were using this as opportunities to make even more money and to evade taxes in their home countries. So um, the global situation of elites and the control of wealth is as dramatic as we see in the U.S. and in some cases even worse when we look at global poverty. So a lot to talk about, including the case in China, and uh, it kind of ends with the discussion of uh, global capitalism and a little bit about the case of um, Darjeeling tea and an anthropologist studying Darjeeling tea. The political economy, basically, as it says here, is looking at the, the economy as central to our lives, but connecting it to issues within state structures, political processes, social contexts, and cultural values. So it's very important to have a political economic approach when we want to try to understand things like inequality. And, uh, you know, talking about college as an example, I often think of this in terms of just opportunities for people who attend wealthy and elite Ivy League institutions and people who attend community colleges. 
you can still have the same opportunities coming out of either system, but built into Ivy League schools is that legacy system where if you're the son of a famous politician or daughter of a famous actor or celebrity, you often get placement into an Ivy League school, even though you don't maybe have um, the um, good grades or test scores or whatever is required to enter those schools. It reminds me of the scandal involving many Hollywood celebrities at Stanford and other institutions, UCLA, I think USC, where they were paying this recruiter to get into programs, you know, millions of dollars to fake that they were on sports teams and so forth. And so this scandal was a big one when it broke and it really showed you just even if you have that legacy system in your favor being wealthy or famous, you're still trying to fix the system. You're still trying to get your kids in even if maybe they don't deserve to get in to Stanford or USC. Structural violence and the politics of Haiti. So structural violence is a type of violence in which the actual social structure institutions harm people by preventing them from meeting basic needs. In other words, Political and economic forces structure risk for various forms of suffering within a population. It could be disease, hunger, violence. And when we saw the Katrina um, hurricane disaster down in the south, in Houston, in New Orleans, of course, we saw examples of people being denied basic services. We've seen some of this with COVID. So inequalities that are built in structurally to society cause what we call forms of structural violence. I believe you'll see this very clearly if you have Netflix in the uh, series Made, which is a very harrowing take on American maid services and workers in lower socioeconomic positions. So that will conclude this chapter. So as you look over this chapter, just be sure to make some of those connections that we're talking about this week. You can look at these examples here, maybe to frame some of your discussions or go with the preset discussions that I have for you this week. All right, so we can jump in to our last chapter for the week, and that is chapter seven, which focuses on politics. Again, really think of the connections of chapters five, six, and seven, because they all interconnect in some interesting ways. So we're first going to look at the basic levels of social and cultural integration, the very famous typology and anthropology of band, tribe, chiefdom, and state. And then we'll look at leadership, we'll look at context of inequality and equality. We'll talk a little bit about the state as well because it has such a bearing, obviously, on understanding who we are in terms of our political and legal structures. So to look at the chapter here, chapter seven, we can begin with a focus on why anthropologists consider politics. And the idea is that every society has levels of social control. So social control means that I tell you what to do, what you should or shouldn't do. Um, if we didn't have levels of social control, we might have anarchistic systems. And I know that there are people who are, of course, interested in ideas of anarchy or um, political systems that maybe have less focus on controlling populations and what people do. And that's a, I think, interesting discussion for people to have. Now, a key concept in both politics and law is the idea of legitimacy, whether or not you have the right to leadership. Some people said after 2016 in the election of Donald Trump that because of his nature, because of his um, racism, his um, promotion of white supremacy, his promotion of anti-democratic principles like those that led to the uh, violent terrorist attacks on January 6th in the Capitol, um, which really could have been terrible. I mean, we could have seen the death, the murder of politicians, including our vice president on that day. Um, a lot of people said Trump had no legitimacy, and some people would say because Trump has taken over the GOP, at least in, at least in this point in time, that the GOP has lost legitimacy as a political party. So legitimacy is always a key part of a legal decision, a political decision. When we talk about legal issues, by the way, there's an entire subset of anthropology called legal anthropology that I encourage you to look into in more depth if you decide to go forward in anthropology. Now, two contexts of social control that are interesting for us to look at this week include positive and negative reinforcements. So it's very easy to remember these positive refers to the idea that I give you a reward, an incentive, like at my work, if we if we get some blood work and a flu shot, we get the opportunity to receive a $50 check. A negative reinforcement would be, you know, you park your car in a place it's not supposed to be, you get a fine, or you might even have to go to court to deal with the situation. So we can talk about also of this in the context of what philosophers called positive and negative forms of liberty or freedom. And generally, I think people say the positive works a little better, but we know that negative reinforcements as forms of social control are also needed in society. Now, next we can talk about the issue of social cultural integration. 
And social cultural integration refers to the extent to which people are integrated in society. In fact, the sociologist Emil Durkheim talked about this in his work and said that if there isn't a right balance, if someone is too integrated and too focused jingoistically, say, on their society or social group, that can be dangerous. And then if someone is not at all connected to society, which reminds me in today's day and age, you can watch everything on TV, you can order stuff from Amazon and never leave your home. That could be low social integration other than social media. Durkheim said if you don't have a balance and someone kind of in the middle being integrated but not too much, not too little, you could have severe consequences for the individual and also for society. Now, Elman Service was a, a famous anthropologist who came up with the category of band, tribes, chiefdom, and state. And to some degree, these go along with the modes of subsistence, not exactly, but if you recall in chapter five, we talked about uh, bands and tribes somewhat being connected to foraging or hunter-gatherer societies. Maybe chiefdoms could be connected to pastoralist societies or horticulturalist societies. And then the state is often connected to forms of agriculture or industrialized agriculture. So you're noting parallels between each of these chapters. In some ways, as I've said, it would be nice if we could like connect these all into one chapter, but that would probably be a lot of reading as it already is with three chapters this week. So I want you to make sure you understand. We're not going to go through these in depth, but understand the basic taxonomy of social organization, the band, the tribe, the chiefdom, the state. This is something you consider in all your anthropology classes um, as an undergraduate and a little bit as a graduate student. We can talk about forms of egalitarianism, whether people are equal or unequal, whether societies are ranked, stratified or unstratified as also a key topic in looking at these characteristics of sociocultural integration. We can talk about the egalitarian versions. We can talk about how in band and tribe-based societies often, because there's a sharing of resources, people maybe have a little more common social experiences. There's less examples of stratification or wealth distribution radically like we see in our capitalist state-based society of today with the CEOs of Amazon and the workers of Amazon being so incredibly far apart in terms of wages and power and benefits. We can also talk about law in band and tribal societies and how in many cases the legal system in those societies focuses on resolving conflicts between warring families or groups or social uh, cliques or even uh, communities versus a state-based society and its legal system where it's about one winner and one loser and less, although it's being discussed today, less the focus on redistributive justice where you're trying to make amends for all the parties involved in the dispute, not just giving one winner and one loser in the case. So it's a good opportunity to compare our legal system with those of other societies. Talk about the big man tradition in Papua New Guinea, check that out. And then we get a lot into how Social orders are created politically via age grades, age sets, and what we call sodalities. Very important topic in many societies to consider. And you can look at how that integration happens via kinship systems, via forms of gift and feasting, and also basic forms of family, marriage, and kinship. And the book repeats a little bit because we have different authors and they're not maybe comparing notes, but you get more of this in the marriage and family chapter. So I'd actually save this kinship stuff and marriage stuff for our, our upcoming chapter. Integration by marriage, of course, is very important. The examples among the Anamami are discussed and you could look at different lineage systems and how those provide for opportunities of creating social order. So if you have systems set up in your kinship system where a particular pattern of marriage is created, that provides for forms of social control and integration at the same time. So we see it happening in a lot of these cases of non-Western societies. Same thing with a lineage system. I'm skipping over quite a bit of this because it is so lengthy and extensive. And I mentioned before, there's a much different approach in terms of law in tribal societies versus, say, in a state-based society. So kind of look at some of those differences. Um, you might not like the principle of the ordeal, but it is one example of an approach that has been used um, to some success in other groups. And we also have examples of the leopard skin chief among the Nuer of Africa, where a third party is involved in a settlement. Other excellent examples out there as well, where you have moot court systems that, again, really attempt to uh, mitigate the damage to multiple parties in a particular dispute or situation.
Warfare, of course, also is an example of, of something that, uh, whether it's uh, tribal societies or state-based societies, people often say there's an interconnection of economics, even subsistence, and certainly politics that happens in context of warfare. When we talk about rank societies, we're talking about greater differences between individuals in those society versus uh, egalitarian societies. And we have to ask, you know, what are the consequences of different forms of rank in those societies? I'm going to jump past some of the lineage and kinship diagrams here. Again, you'll get a lot more of this in the kinship and marriage chapter. Very good information here. Um, you could you could skim some of this. I feel like the kinship stuff will come back to you. And it hits maybe a greater level of detail than is needed in this chapter. I feel like this chapter is a little uneven in some senses in terms of how they construct the examples. You can also talk about secret societies and how integration happens among secret societies. Now, in stratified societies, we're talking about something entirely opposite of the egalitarian society. In a stratified society, we have a social structure that has two or more largely mutually exclusive populations. In a caste system like in India, you have people born into a particular social class or caste, and they often cannot get out of that for life. Whereas in other societies, maybe you have more forms of what we call social mobility. People can work, get education, um, get into politics or whatever field, and then eventually move up in that society. Although in today's day and age in the U.S., I think a lot of concerns would be uh, had about whether or not there is as much social mobility as we like to think. In the state level of political organization, we see that um, there's a much different approach where um, we often have, you know, monopolies or even dictatorships where um, the government controls a lot of the basic decisions of the society. I think in the U.S., a lot of that power has shifted to corporations, and we often talk about neoliberalism as a feature, which you can look up separate from our class this week if you lot like. And also there are ideologies that often justify the relations of social class and power and stratification and a state-based society. We often hear that because we have a free market, we have opportunities in this nation for people to get ahead with a free market system. Again, is that the question here for us today is, is that more ideology or is there truth to that idea? There's also a really good discussion of the formation of states. And this is a key topic that you consider if you take an archeology span class along with the origins of agriculture. A lot of uh, questions about how did states evolve? And a lot of different reasons are given for this, and you get a few of these um, in, in this chapter. More discussion of law and order in a state-based society, as well as warfare. So there's kind of a pattern that the author follows here in looking at law, political order, inequality, and also the issue of uh, warfare. Now, focusing on Jaron Diamond's book, Collapse, I think the question becomes, what happens when a state collapses? What happens if we start to use up the resources to go back to the issue of Malthus in chapter five, and uh, we run out of resources or the inequality gaps between the rich and the poor and even the middle class be some, become so great that you have people wanting to overthrow a government or the state or do terrible terrorist acts. I think a lot of what happened, and they mention here with the insurrection in January of 2020 with Trump and what he wanted to do to get uh, people to overtake the Capitol and maybe violently take the ballots that the electors had there to certify the election. He was clearly trying to create a situation of a coup, at least a quasi-coup. We have to ask some serious questions like, could we see fascism? Could we see tyranny? Could we see the rule of, of a very few and a very violent few in a society that purports to be democratic? I think what we saw with Trump and his willingness to overturn the election, to claim, make false claims about it, really reminded me of some things that happened in Europe many years ago, if you know what I'm talking about. And I think it's just a real dangerous wake-up call for us to get involved and to try to really protect our democracy from forces that might be within our society trying to take it over or dismantle it. So I think the conclusion for chapter seven is really one to ask some questions about where are we headed in terms of combining all these chapters. We could ask, ask some questions about sustainability. We could ask about our political system, about the issues of inequality that we have noted throughout this discussion here of these three chapters. So again, a lot to consider this week. I realize you've had a ton of reading. I did give you some additional readings that you can check out. So if you want to check out Patagonia's Footprint Chronicles, a really great website that shows you 
one company's attempt to track its labor and environmental practices and give themselves grades. You can also look at the Freegan uh, article here and videos I've included for you as one opportunity to maybe dismantle our consumption practices focused on waste. You can read a little more about garbage and overconsumption in a couple of my articles here. Thomas Piketty's work is a revision of Karl Marx's capital kind of for today's day and age. Check out the reading here, which is a condensed version of his super long 700 page book. And also check out the video I've included of his work. And then lastly, the life and death of an Amazon temp worker, I think reminds me really of the film Nomadland with Francis McDermott, which won Academy Awards and Golden Globe Awards, and reminds us that there's a lot of inequality and temporary work in our society. And I feel like COVID-19 in 2019 onwards really exacerbated a lot of issues of inequality as we saw happening with what we could call structural violence, going back to the case in Chapter 7. The Zobelin video, I definitely recommend checking this out. These are a group of Coptic Christians in Cairo, Egypt, who have taken a new and interesting and possibly innovative approach to recycling goods and redistributing waste in a society to contrast with our approaches in the U.S. Again, the Freegan videos also get into that issue. The late anthropologist David Graeber, very famous and important anthropologist who studied capitalism and anarchism, um, his life ended too early a couple years ago. Definitely encourage you to look at his work, also the work of Thomas Piketty, who uh, revised uh, a lot of Marx's approaches and ideas. And then for Chapter 7, you can check out Deborah Thomas to see what a political anthropologist does in their own work. A couple more to mention here. Um, in terms of fair trade, again, I really encourage you this week to think about whether or not fair trade is something that maybe has possibilities to transform both our national economies and capitalist systems of consumption, and also the global uh, market systems that we've been talking about this week. Here's the example of feral trade. If you want to check this out, you can look up feral trade by Kate Rich. Interesting idea of trying to subvert traditional exchange systems in a more local system. And then I think I have one more for you here is to look at, if you have Netflix, check out Made. It's a very tough film to watch. It's very difficult. It deals with domestic violence, with issues of parenting. And what's interesting about it, some people have called it a virtual poverty simula simulator. As you watch it, the protagonist's money is going down more and more and more. And it really shows you how every little dollar or cent counts in a society. Early on in the series, she is unable to secure some housing because she first has to have a job. And in order to get a job, she has to find childcare. But in order to get childcare, she has to have a job. So it's like this loop that she's caught in that really emphasizes a lot of problems in a capitalist society where we don't care about workers who make very little money, workers who struggle with being single parents and struggling with domestic violence and other issues. So very poignant film or series that you can watch. And I feel like it's it's one that really kind of highlights some of those issues we're talking about this week in a very uh, poignant sense. So that'll be it for this week. I know it's been a really lengthy uh, focus on our three chapters, a lot of reading, but work through those this week. By the way, connected to the show Made, you have a activity that is due. It's an activity where you'll work with the game Spent, an online game, and you'll have to write a short paper on that. So it's your second written assignment. Please check out my walkthrough video because I take you through the website and I give you some suggestions about how to do this exercise that really in some ways parallels what you'll notice in this series called Made on Netflix. So thanks for listening. I'll be back next week with our week six video walkthrough.